Hey everybody, all right, so today we're gonna do something a little different. We have a very special guest here today. We're gonna talk some Star Wars, and uh, the gentleman's name is a good friend of mine. His name is Dre. You might know him on Twitter as at Vash Sky. Dre, welcome to the show. Hello there. Glad to be here. Really, really glad to be here. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. So today we're gonna talk Star Wars, and we're also gonna dive into some Galaxy's Edge. Um, so first things first, the elephant in the room, the Rise of Skywalker trailer. What are your overall thoughts on what you saw just a few days ago with the trailer? Um, you know, I, I, I gotta be, I gotta be honest. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat things. I don't want to beat around the bush here. I, I, like visually, it is absolutely stunning. I mean, it is absolutely a gorgeous trailer. Um, you could really see even George Lucas's influence on this project. Um, it, it gave me a lot of like um, prequel vibes in the sense that visually, the visual language for each location, for, for each cinematic shot, you knew exactly um, what you were getting. Uh, they, they were, you know, the, the variety of the aesthetics, the worlds, um, the colors used. It was, it was all inspiring. There are some great visuals within that trailer. It just didn't get me emotionally. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's where I, my impasse is right now. That, that's fair. That's fair. And I don't, I don't necessarily disagree with you on that, actually. I think that, um, I think visually, JJ is the king of visuals. I mean, right. he, he always knocks out of the park. Um, I would give the trailer an 8.5 out of 10. The only reason why I didn't think it was a complete home run is that end shot. You know, with, with the D23 um, teaser, we got Dark Ray, which got everyone talking. It, it blew the internet up. And yeah. even for the teaser at, at Star Wars Celebration, we got Palpatine's cackle at the very end. Right. So I think we kind of got like, we, we got accustomed to having that wow moment at the end that's going to blow our mind. And then we ended this trailer with just a close up on Ray, of Ray. So I felt like it, it just kind of, I don't know, the ending to me was a little bit of a letdown. I think if it ended with like a shot of Palpatine or like a Force Ghost Anakin or something, it would have been a phenomenal trailer. Well, it, it's... It, 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 Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. I just say, it just, it just didn't stick the landing, you know? Yeah, um, you know, it's, these things are kind of a, a difficult balance um, for the producers of the film and for the marketing department because you have to get people interested enough to actually go see it, but without spoiling every single thing or every single surprise or every single reveal that's going to be featured in the film. So I think like you said, I, there's not like that, like, wow, like, holy smokes, I got to go see this film moment that we have been privy to in the, in the previous um, release material for it. But um, and I, I think that's just JJ saying, hey, I think people are already hyped. I think people are already interested. Um, this can push it over the edge a little bit. But as far as big reveals, I think they're I think they're holding back a little bit. I think they're saving that for the film, which honestly is what they should do. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to. Yeah, that's true. You don't want to give away too much in the trailers because it gives people less incentive to go see it. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if they give away, you're right. If they give away palps now, um, yeah, take away the curiosity factor a little bit, you know. Right, and that's kind of where I am. I'm more curious than anything. I'm curious with how they'll end this whole trilogy with how they'll end this saga um you know I'm, I'm curious what is palpatine's involvement there's a lot of aspects of the trailer i'm 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 or the film i should say i'm really curious about that piqued my interest in that way so on that front hey i'm i'm you know I, i'm in as far as as far as that goes so now um me and you have talked um before many times um about Absolutely. the last jedi and and yep. and you know, I, I liked the film. I enjoyed it a lot. You were disappointed by it. Yeah. I, I you know, initially when I saw it, I, I came out of the theater just going, wow, is that, was that, that was good, right? And, you know, I asked my friends that I saw it with, family members, you know, was that, that was, 
was that that was good that was good right that was, i mean that was a good film like i had mixed feelings <laughs> on it and as i saw it again in theaters saw it again in um the released formats of you know blu-ray and all that it's just i i just i have personal problems with it um so you know I, i'm i don't know if you would classify me as a last should i hate her but i i don't prefer that film i, I for me if you were going to rank all the star wars films it would it, it probably go at the very bottom for me yeah. and look that's not to take away from anybody's opinion of it some people really love and enjoy that film and what's interesting about going into the rise of skywalker is that they're going to have different camps that they kind of have to or not maybe not have to but that they want would want to appease in terms of you've got the you know you've you've got the gen ones who saw these films maybe um in theaters when they were children or maybe uh, you know were introduced to these films uh later in their life but before the pre prequels you got the prequel fans you got the new trilogy fans so you've got different factions and they all want different things and how they're going to appease all of them or or as many of them as maybe possible to 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 broaden the base for this is going to be really interesting. It, yeah, I agree with you. And it's one mm -hmm. of those things where it's like it 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 feels like a very daunting task. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah. um, oh absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's extremely daunting. Um I do have faith in JJ in that regard only because I think people sort of underestimate the daunting task that he had with Force Awakens and and what I mean by that is Force Awakens was a film that you had to appeal, like you said, to the OT, uh, the people that grew up on the OT, you know, uh, yeah. the older fans. And then you have to appeal to the, also to the prequel fans. Yeah. But you, at the same time, you have to kind of like bring new people in to the franchise. I think J.J. masterfully really did that with The Force Awakens. Now, can he repeat that same magic with this movie with rise of skywalker that's yet to be seen but i do have faith i mean because of his history with force awakens that he can juggle all those plates and, and, and really come through um it'll be interesting to see how that pans out i did want to ask you because you didn't love last jedi sure what is your what are your feelings going into rise of skywalker it, are, <clears throat> is, is, are the teasers and what you've seen so far is it something that are, is, is, are they slowly winning you back? Has it had no effect at all? What, what are your feelings going into this? Um, being, you know, that you didn't really love the last film. It's an interesting question. Um, I think they're slowly, and I mean very slowly, <laughs> winning me back into maybe seeing this movie. Now, look, I, I will tell you this, you know, I didn't, buy my tickets Monday night when they went on sale. Um, that's the first time I've ever done that. So I haven't bought in quite just yet. Yeah. But am I going to see this film? Absolutely. Is it going to be in a theater? Probably at this point, probably I, what here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the reaction to the film. I'm waiting for, Hey, maybe it may not, maybe not everybody will love it, but will everybody like it enough to recommend it? Right. And that's kind of like where I'm at with it. I'm kind of waiting to see what is the reaction going to be from the various <laughs> factions of this thing? You know, is it going to be something where it's like one side really loves it and one side really hates it? Is it going to be something where it's like, yeah, that was pretty good from all sides, <laughs> you know, how how that's all going to play out is what I'm most curious about. And that's why I've kind of held off um, buying a ticket. Uh, that and, it, it, unfortunately, around that time, I'm, I'm pretty busy myself. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm on the outside looking in at this point. <laughs> but they are slowly, you know, moving in that direction there. Um, yeah. Like I said, I got the trailer playing back. <laughs> nice, <so. laughs> nice, nice. Well, you know, I, you know, um, yeah, that's fair. You know, definitely. And I think that you know, the, uh, an important thing to consider too when, when you're when you're when you're gauging these reactions yeah. is like if you know, I remember the Last Jedi, and it came out 
all the critics were praising it. This is a masterpiece, a gorgeous movie. Every, all the critics that do this for a living loved it, right? Yeah. It wasn't until the fans got a hold of it yeah. that they were more disappointed and the divide really started to come. Right. Well, it'll be interesting to see, like the critics, I, I kind of feel like they're going to love it because they've loved all the Disney Star Wars movies. But I, I think that way, yeah the more important uh, metric will be, like you said, the fans. All the different factions, are they going to love it? Are they right. going to be united? And uh, I think if, if, if it gets the same reaction or similar to Force Awakens, we're in good hands. But so. if, it, if it starts to go down the Last Jedi route, <laughs> we're in for a, a bumpy ride, to say the least, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's that's the thing. I mean, we've it's been very interesting to see and, and contrast this with other films that have been released within the last two or three years or so and see this kind of split between critics and audience in regards to a lot of films that have come out. So I like, like you said, I'm going to be very interested to see what the fans say versus what the critics say and what segments of fans say now that it's kind of, you know, branched off the way it has. It's it's gonna be gonna be quite interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be very very interesting. Um, now I did want to also discuss because this kind of ties into the fan the fandom divide. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk about Lucasfilm employees and their interactions with <sighs> on on like various social media. And yeah. we talked about this privately, and I wanted to, I wanted to talk about this today because I think it's an interesting subject. Uh, very. Um, so since the Last Jedi, Lucasfilm employees, whether it be Chuck Wendig, or even as recently as Freddie Prinze Jr., right? And, you know, he went on a little rant recently, mm -hmm. and uh, Ryan Johnson ha has has has, ha has mm -hmm. some altercations online. Now, here's the thing I wanted to ask you. We, we, the, the landscape is changing, right? Absolutely. Like 20 years ago, you couldn't directly talk to your favorite director. It, everything was through the television, really, right? Yep. Now, with Twitter and things like that, you know, you can tweet Ryan Johnson and he can reply back to you directly. Or you can tweet at Chuck Wendig and he can reply back to you or Pablo Hidalgo. Um, mm -hmm. So the dynamic has changed. So what are your thoughts on this in regards to because the landscape has changed do a, a, as a fandom do we have to set like new rules of engagement um you know on our part and in terms of the lucasfilm employees what role do they play do they have to kind of bite their tongue or they, should they defend themselves against attacks should they not get involved what are your overall feelings in regards to the fandom and the lucasfilm employees relationship online this what are your feelings this that? is a tricky tricky avenue right because like you said we're in uncharted waters here when it comes to the 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 interactions that can take place between the fandom and the creators of the films um you know when the prequels came out uh, there was still that barrier up right you know the you know between the between the media giving access uh to the creators through them to the fans there was that kind of barrier that you know fans could voice their opinions in message rooms and in you know various forms of internet online activity but you were never directly conversating directly to george lucas and so george lucas you know could either take that criticism one or two ways he could take it to heart or he could completely ignore it and everything and, and everything in between and i i think if you track the prequels, I think he did take some of that criticism from the heart. You know, we saw a lot less Jar Jar Binks going, yeah. you know, from, from episode one to episode three, right? That's true, um, yeah. We saw a lot more familiar locations, a lot more familiar uh, characters. We, we started to kind of see the evolution of that take place, and some of that, I think, was derived from the fandom. But now that, man, now, now – Man, Ryan Johnson could just be talking to anybody. Uh, you know, it, it, Chuck Wendig could have a conversation with anybody now. And now, and now, so we have this kind of this channel to them, and it's it's changed the dynamic entirely. And so, the, I think the fandom, as far as 
you know, people talk about, oh, it's toxic, it's vitriolic and all that. I, I, honestly, I don't, I don't think it's changed all that much at all. I, I mean, the, you know, I, I lived going through the prequels. I, you know, I was there as a very, very small child <laughs> going to see uh, Phantom Menace. I think it was nine, um, you know, back in the, back in the theater. And I remember the response to the prequels, how they kind of changed and morph and how people, you know, they were kind of upset with George Lucas and all, and all that. Um, w- when I look at it today, I, I think, I think you've got people casting a lot of people in, in some, some pretty bad lights. And that's the, that's the important thing to realize, right? Disney wasn't purchasing Star Wars for the franchise. Really, in actuality, they were purchasing the fan base. This is something they bought into. Right. You're right. Um, that's a great point. And, yeah, they, they, they wanted a kind of a, a made-ready fan base, and this is what they got. So, on, on the one hand, you know, can it be, um, you know, a little sordid? Can it be a little you know, um, what should I say, uh, you know, vitriolic? Yeah, it can be. Um, but that's that's kind of what you're getting in. That's kind of, everybody kind of knew that going into it. What I say is, look, everybody should have, you know, th- everybody should be as respectful as possible. Everybody should have a decorum, um, uh, you know, with, with how they handle these things online, stuff like that. I don't, you know, I, I'm I'm not for anybody calling out creators and, you know, saying, oh, you suck and all that o- online, you know, far worse things. At the same time, though, I think the creators should be held to maybe a higher standard um, than just somebody freelancing or somebody, you know, because, look, you're still representing the company at some level. It's true. You're still, you're still representing not only Lucasfilm but Disney and so many jobs are tied to your performance and what you say. I think there should be a a little bit of a raised standard there. And look, there are many solutions out there to mitigate people who are being vitriolic at you, blocking them, muting them, whatever. Um, But look, I mean, I'm, I'm watching the NFL right now. I've been an NFL fan for, for a lot of years. People can get, way more vitriolic than star wars fans i mean star oh, yeah. wars fans they're, they're, i mean they, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even last two seconds within nfl fandoms you know when you talk about the eagles fans the jets fans it's crazy would a coach ever go out or an owner ever go out and criticize people and what they're saying and stuff like that you know so there are there, the, the, you know, this kind of thing exists in other places and stuff like that. And you kind of have to say, how do they handle it? I think a lot of people were driven up in their, what is it, hatred or whatever right. of Star Wars or Disney Star Wars. I hate that term, by the way. But Oh, thank you. Me too. I, I mean, it's, I hate it. <laughs> Absolutely hate it. We don't call it Disney Marvel, but we call it Disney Star Wars. Thank That's you. A, that's a whole other thing. We got to get into that. But, um, you. you know, like, I think people were driven more by the responses from Lucasfilm. And that's yeah. what, if you look at, um, there's a guy, at Data Racer. I've since been blocked by him. I think you have as well. Yeah, I have. Online. If you see his bio, it says, I'll stop when Lucasfilm employees stop berating fans or whatever. It says it in his bio, and that's yeah. what—that's apparently what motivates him. And I think that's true. I think this was driven a lot worse by some of the responses from Lucasfilm employees, and yeah. and, and I, there's got to be a raised standard there. I mean, look, they they can defend themselves. I'm not saying that they can't, but you got to be respectful, and you can't sink down to their level while doing it. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you make a great point, Ray, and and not only. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely defend. They have a- absolute right to defend themselves. Yeah. Be respectful. And I think ab- above it, above all of that, like you said, you pour, you pour gasoline on the fire, sure. whether, whether, whether they're right or wrong in, in, in their response to what the, the attack was right. by responding and, and going after a fan, you pour gasoline on, on the fire and you create more, data racers, <laughs> people that are p- 
pissed and they now now they're taking it personally because now ryan johnson came at me on twitter and it's a personal thing and you rile people up you know at first i may have been scorned now i have a vendetta that's that's what's going on here yeah no i i understand where i understand that perspective completely and i i agree that i think it does in a lot of ways make things worse i think a lot of the the fandom the fandom menace uh movement mm-hmm. I, I think would have become would have been a lot less i think if not for this aspect of the back and forth with the creators on Twitter and things like that. I do think it has made it worse. And, and that's, like I said, I mean, that's not to say that these, that the creators don't have a right to defend themselves. Oh. And that's not to say that a lot of the fans aren't vile and disgusting. Cause a lot of the stuff is vile and disgusting. Absolutely. But, yeah. But they have to, the response matters. And I think when you give credence to it and you go, when you go in the mud with them, uh, nothing good is going to come of that, you know, and it only hurts the brand and all that. So yeah, no, you make some great points, man. And I, I do agree. I mean, I think that um, there has to be some level of these creators and maybe they're slowly learning this, but I think that there has to be some level of like, you know what? It's not worth it. This guy has like a hundred followers on Twitter. Why am I going to sit here and, and, and go down to, his or her level just leave it alone you know <laughs> and that's the equation you have to make you know i think at this point more than just great films that lucasfilm has to produce at this point going forward um i think they really have to cultivate that fan relationship again i mean there were there were some programs done before um george lucas sold lucasfilm where they really cultivated fans and and you know um you know certain certain factions thereof like the 501st for example if you buy the star wars blu-ray the the whole um saga set that they have right now going through episodes one through six there's a great documentary on there where lucasfilm invited 501st members to march with george lucas in the rose bowl parade that year and you just don't see that anymore you just don't hear about that anymore there's 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 kind of a, a, a layer. Hey, this is Lucasfilm. And this is the fans. You know, it, it, they they gotta really kind of repair that a little bit and do some, maybe some fan outreach and and just kind of repair that relationship. And and look to to Dave Filoni's credit, I think he's doing that a little bit. We heard about the Mandalorian, how they actually reached out to 500 first members to you know star in an episode of that film when they needed some stormtroopers for the set. You know, they kind of cool. reached out and said. Hey, well, you know, I, I, I happen to know some sword troopers. Let's go get them. You know, I think that, I think that stuff is fantastic. I think that stuff is great. And it go, can go a long way to kind of mending this whole thing and bringing everybody together. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think stuff like that would make a huge difference. And even some of these, these, um, you know, the, these directors and stuff to kind of put out an olive branch and say, Hey, look, you know what? We, we've all gotten heated in this, in these arguments and these debates online, but, uh, you know, let's put it behind us and let's move forward together as a fandom or just kind of address it. Like you said, I think would go a long, long way. And I think the, the rational fans <laughs> would definitely take that and go, okay, cool. You know, you know what? You're right. Let, let's move on, you know? So yeah, it would definitely, definitely go a long way. Yeah. So now mm-hmm. I do want to talk about, now we're going to, we're going to step away from the movies a little bit and we're going to get into galaxy's edge. Galaxy's edge. Galaxy's edge. Oh boy. <laughs> um, now galaxy's edge, no secret. I'm a huge fan and um, we've talked and I know you're a huge fan. You are, you loved it as well. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. It was, it's phenomenal land. It's one of Disney's best, but um, mm-hmm. now when it first came, when it first opened in Anaheim this past like June, basically, end of May, early June. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the crowds were light, or, or they, were, you know, Bob Iger came out at the shareholder quarterly earnings um, call and said, "Hey, you know, it lighter than expected." What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the the public, the, the the outrage online has been overblown? Do you think that the, the, that this is a little overdone? Do you think it's you know, what are your thoughts on this whole crowd issue? Is it is it something that's kind of been, you know, exacerbated online and it's not really there? Or is it something that, like, it's a real problem for Disney? Listen, I think 
the best point that I ever heard on that was the point you made in one of your videos when you're talking about Avatar. Listen, if it, if it all came down to the franchise, why is Avatar doing the business it's doing? Why is it, you know, three hour waits for a uh, flight of passage and stuff like that? I mean, what's, what's going on there? I thought Avatar, nobody cared about. And here's the thing. Ask anybody. Can you name a single character from Avatar? I think that question is going to be no from nine out of 10 people, maybe nine, nine out of a hundred people. Right. But right. people are still showing up. So what happened with galaxy's edge? Well, I think it's, I think it's a multi-layered issue. And that's, that's why when you heard the response from Bob Chapek and Bob Iger regarding galaxy's edge, it was a multi-layered response issue because there's a lot of things going into it. I think first off, rise of the resistance not being opening you know the the new brand new big e-ticket attraction the big big attraction not being open on opening day was an issue um i think listen when it comes to selling vacation packages and having people book trips big e-ticket attractions drive that business and so with it not being there on opening day i think that caused a lot of people to rethink and go well Maybe I should go or put off my trip to when that is going to be open. Because as we know, a trip to Disney, whether it be Walt Disney World, Disneyland, if you're out of state or whatever, it, it's, it's a big investment. So am I going to invest now or am I going to invest later? And I think that had a lot to do with it. Second, um, you know, you saw, I think if we take our minds back to May and June and stuff like that, when this thing actually open you had a lot of people who were worried about the crowds i mean we we saw we were following twitter at that moment we saw everybody making memes and making pictures and you know the crowds just you know completely saturating the entire land and you're not going to be able to move and all that i think that scared a lot of people i think that legitimately did scare a lot of people off and saying maybe i should wait for these crowds to to wind down i think the other Part of it, Laz was brought up in that uh, Q3 report, was a lot of surrounding hotels upping prices, having it be something that, hey, look, if I am going to invest in going to Galaxy's Edge, it's probably one of the most expensive times to visit. So I think that affected things. Um, You know, there there are so many. And and look, for Disney fans, there were some... I don't know if you want to call them promises, but there were some things going out of what Galaxy's Edge was going to be. And maybe some of those things getting cut, as we know, maybe that did affect some things. Maybe that was like, hmm, where's the entertainment? Where's the, you know, where are the aliens? Where are the droids? Where are these things that they said was going to be here? You know, and and I think all of that kind of goes into it. As far as like, oh well, the fr- you know the franchise is doing well, as the fandom menace uh, types might say. I don't think that nearly has as much to play into it as some of these other things that may have affected the land. And look, and to your point, like you said, I mean, Walt Disney World hadn't opened at that point. Remember, everybody east of the Mississippi. It's going to probably wait for that version to be open. So that cuts, you know, things in half there. People waiting for Rise of Resistance. I think you have to factor all of these things in before you can put an assessment on Galaxy's Edge as a whole right now. As, as, as we've gone into the year, more, mer- more and more marketing has come out. More commercials have come out. They pushed it a little bit harder. And we're seeing those crowds there. Yeah. I mean, any Saturday – You've got people going all the way down Main Street, waiting rope drop just to get in there opening at opening time. So this thing is turning around. I think Rise of the Resistance, you're going to see a lot of people show up for this, this brand new attraction, which looks phenomenal. Yeah, no, you make some great points. And also, I think people have to understand, I think there's a lot of, there's a misconception out there that the quarterly earnings that Iger was speaking of, when he said that the attendance has been lighter than expected, only reflected uh, one month of Galaxy's Edge um, being open. And that one month was during the reservation period or that quarter, you know? And for those of you that are watching that aren't familiar with that reservation period, you either had to 
wait in a queue online to try to get reservations to get in, which can be a pain. Or you had to spend like 500 bucks a night at a Disney resort <laughs> hotel, which is expensive for a lot of people. For most people, yeah. it's pricey. So I think that the next quarter will be a more true tell of the the demand, the success or failure of Galaxy's Edge because it'll it'll give us now a few months of the land being open to anybody. And that's just the thing too. You can't just measure this in terms of people showing up or not showing up. Look at the sales of merchandise in the land. I mean, things were sold out. I, I was keeping daily trackers on Reddit, on Twitter, of things that were in stock and out of stock. You know, merchandise was flying off the shelves. Food was flying off the shelves. I think the sales, they even said in the third, in the uh, third quarter report that sales per person were higher when they were when you know at as galaxy's edge has opened so this idea that oh it's complete failure according to the numbers that 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 i've heard of internally not according to you know things being out of stock where you couldn't even get them i went to galaxy's edge during the reservation period only got in there one day and all of the items that i wanted weren't available they just I couldn't get them even if I wanted to. And so how, you know, th- th- that you had to factor that in too. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that, and that plays to your, your, your other point where, it, yeah, this is a multi layered situation, you know, and there's going to be areas that are like the merchandise and the food and the drink sales that are through the roof, but maybe the attendance is a little lighter or, you know, this isn't like a, you know, a lot of a lot of people like to paint it as either like it has to be a massive hit or a complete and total failure. And like you were saying, there's multiple things going on here. It's not so cut and dry with this stuff. And um, yeah, it's interesting. And uh, I think that the next quarterly report is November. If I'm not mistaken, it's November seventh, I believe. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, so it's coming up fast. <laughs> it's okay. coming up fast, so we should get yeah. some more numbers. It'll be interesting to see. I'm very curious as to what that report's going to say about the parks and Galaxy's Edge and all mm. that, you know? We've seen attendance uh, come up here, at least in Anaheim. Um, we've seen attendance come up a little bit uh, since the holidays have gone to place. And Look, I- I've not seen a photo of Galaxy's Edge for the last couple of weeks now where it's been anything but pretty pretty healthy yeah so i think it's going to be interesting to see what that report is like you said i like the wait time argument though oh the wait times are low and stuff like that oh millennium falcon smugglers run oh it's what it's not 360 minutes oh come on that's just complete failure it's like whoa 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 let's back up the train here look just because it's not doing 14 hour lines on the opening day, like Hagrid's Magical Creature Motorbike Adventures, try saying that t- five times faster. <laughs> the way. Just because it ain't doing that doesn't mean it's a failure. Look, you got Fast Pass and all these attractions, including uh, Flight of Passage. You don't have that on Millennium Falcon right. Smuggler's Run, which, you know, if you, if you want to see what the effect would be, just go ahead and double those wait times and then you, then you tell me how, how well it's doing or how well it's not doing. It's still getting, I mean, I was just looking on the Disneyland app a few days ago. It was getting 90 minutes, 100 minutes, stuff yeah. like that consistently. And, and again, rise the resistance. And I'm telling you, I mean, I want to see that annual report. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, quarterly report when that right opens because you're going to see everybody coming out of the woodworks for that thing. Like I said, I mean, it sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, I, I've heard some great stuff inside. It, it, it's, it sounds fantastic, really. It does. It really does. It really does. I can't wait for that. I really can't. I think it's going to be a game changer. It's going to be the, the next generation Indiana Jones adventure, essentially. So it sounds like. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be very cool. Now, before, mm-hmm. before we go, Dre, I wanted to ask you one more question. This is just a quick little prediction question. Okay. Um, we've seen the, yesterday and the day before some of these pre-sale numbers for Rise of Skywalker coming out. They've been pretty solid. Pretty solid. Yeah. What are your thoughts, what's your prediction on, and I know it's early, but it's just kind of fun to kind of predict and kind of, what are your, what do you, what's your overall prediction for, for Rise of Skywalker's box office? What, where do you think it's going to land? 
I know you wanted this quick, but I got to clear some things up here. Go, go, ahead, Adam, go ahead. The uh, the Adam Tickets stuff. Don't get too attached to that report there. I was looking at Adam Tickets. Um, they found it in about 2012. They have backing from the Walt Disney Studios company and um, 20th Century Fox. JJ, I think, sits on their board. So don't get too attached to those numbers. I know a lot of outlets are going on about that. Uh, just, just understand and, you know, just so that you're aware where the source is coming from on there. They, they, they might look a little rosy for a reason. Um, we've now seen that Fandango is reporting that pre-sale tickets are higher than any previous Star Wars film um, on their end. Honestly, I see this thing doing about 1.5. Um, I think, you know, if you compare it to Avengers Endgame or, or the Marvel films at all, um, you have a lot of international box office. If you look at Box Office Mojo and the breakup between domestic and international, I think it's about a one to two split. I, I think it's 30% um, domestic and 60% more or more, 70%. Um, international. I don't think the rise of Skywalker will benefit from the international market that much. I think it's going to be a very domestic product for them. So I, I put it at about 1.5. I think people are really curious about seeing this thing to its conclusion. I think people who are invested in this trilogy are definitely going to go see this movie. I think a lot of people, including mainstream audiences are going to say, Hey, you know what? Star Wars film in December looks good. looks good on paper. Let's go see it. I, I see this thing doing about 1.5. I yeah, think it's slightly I, higher than last Jedi and a little bit lower than force awakens. Go ahead. That, no, that's it. That's it. That's exactly where I'm at with it. Actually. I, I think it will definitely do more than last Jedi just because I feel JJ is, is, is going to fan service the hell out of this thing. I mean, we know he is. <laughs> and I think the general audience will eat it up a lot more than The Last Jedi. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it will do more than The Last Jedi, which did like 1.3, I believe. Um, yep. But yeah, there's no way it's touching Endgame because China just doesn't care about Star Wars. And you need China to get over that 2 billion mark, I think. You, know? you do. You do. I mean, it's the second largest market for them uh, or for Hollywood in general. Yeah. Um, you you really need China's input on this. You, you really need the backing of the international box office to get you over that too. Um, I, I mean, Force Awakens is kind of you you can't really compare that to any other film because there's so much hype going into that. If you oh, yeah. look at the domestic box office, I think that was like 900 million that it made just domestically, which is Domestic. unheard of yeah. for any movie, including even, a Marvel film. Yeah, even Endgame didn't do that domestically. I mean, no, it's crazy. absolutely not. I mean, it's just, it, it was a juggernaut domestically. So I think a lot of that energy is probably going to go into the rise of Skywalker, but but just, it's not going to meet TFA. No. So it's it's really going to be interesting um, to see what happens. I'm I'm very very curious to see what happens. Like I said, my curiosity is peaked. <laughs> yeah, it'll be very it'll be very interesting to see where it lands on that box office. And it really also comes down to you now the pre-sale, like you mentioned, they can be great, and you know all that stuff is wonderful. But if the movie comes out and it's divisive like Last Jedi, you know that might damper its numbers. We don't know yet you know, so we'll see what happens. But yeah, as of right now, I'm right with you. I think it'll, I think it'll probably hit 1.4, 1.5-ish and uh, do pretty decent. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. It'll, it's it's going to be a fun ride nonetheless to watch. I, I you know, it, and you, you got to look at that, that second week drop off there. I mean, if it's, yep. if it's like Last Jedi, and I think that was like 73% or something, which is a crazy high number. That'll tell you all you need to know. If, it, if this thing has legs, we're going to find out very, very quickly if it does. Um, but uh, I, I honestly, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be fascinating. It's going to be very interesting indeed. Thank you, Vash. Thank you yep. so much for coming on. I do, I do appreciate you. I want to do more of these. I want to really, this time we spent a lot of, you know, we, we, we talked about Star Wars and stuff, but I want to have you on again. Maybe we'll talk about the theme parks and all that good stuff. So hopefully you're, you're I have. Endless, 
endless knowledge that will serve me nowhere but here probably. So <laughs> if you want to know anything, if you want to, you know, jump on and talk about anything regarding theme parks, anything regarding Marvel, Star Wars, the, the Disney company as a whole, you let me know. I'll, I'll be right there. Awesome. You're always welcome. Thank you, Vash. I appreciate you, sir. Thank you.